uh, about 500 yards from here is a station that was last used as, um, by the public in, on 22nd of May 1932. Um, and we're seeing if there's a way in which we can bring that station back into use. Uh, the amount of media interest in terms of disused station is vastly greater than anything that we have above ground. So I spend, I've spent a lot of the last week doing media interviews um, for disused stations um, and I had a big session yesterday with all the interested parties as to how they could bring forward down street disused stations. Ideally, hopefully in the next 24 hours or so we'll be able to, at least for this week, wrap up down street disused stations and then we can concentrate on where the value is uh, and what more we can do above ground. In terms of, in terms of that, uh, we are, as many of you will know, in the midst of our procurement exercise. We had uh, 52 submissions. We shortlisted down to 16. Uh, paperwork for those 16 is going out end of this week. Um, and we'll go through a process which, uh, if everything goes according to plan, and I'm very keen that it should do, we'd be in a position in which we've done the paperwork by the middle of October that would enable us to get to a TfL board sign-off before the end of the calendar year um, to mean that we're then in a position to start mini competition on sites and I'll explain about sites in a second such that we've got sites being allocated to those um, ultimately successful partners uh, before the end of the financial year. Um, we're working on sites, things are generally going very well on the sites, we've got, uh, you know, the initial sites will include things like South Kent Station, which TfL's been staring at unsuccessfully for 30 odd years and there's a glorious scheme just waiting to be done. Uh, other sites like Bermondsey, Kidbrook, St George's Circus, we've got great sites in central London. Um, very keen that we get the partners on board and then in a position to get those sites underway. Um, in order to make that happen, we're also in the midst of recruitment. Uh, my development team's growing, we think, from what well, the moment we're going from 5 to 29. I'm keen then to get on to the next set of sites. So we've got, you know, we had identified, um, as it happens, 51 sites that uh, we were going to take forward with the property partners. Um, since then, um, we've identified some more uh, within surface transport, so streets where we're removing gyratories, bus stations. We had assumed um, four of the 51 were surface sites. Surfers have now come to us with a further 40 sites they'd like us to have a look at. Now, not all of those are going to come forward, but you know we're doing the initial work ourselves on the operational and planning feasibility of bringing those forward. Um, but then, of course, we've got, um, you know, I think I've now got my head around Crossrail sites. I need to get my head around Crossrail 2 sites. I need to get my head around the fact that we've got 61 car parks. We've got a lot of spaces in zones 2, 3, 4, 5 that um, if we're moving, as we are indeed increasingly towards thinking about long-term income rather than capital receipts, then increasingly thinking about PRS and Outer London must make sense. Um, I'm also keen to get my head around infill development. We've got thousands of sites around London and not all of them are going to be um, appropriate for the property partners who we've identified. So understanding what different groupings of sites might be and who might be the right people to work with um, on those. Um, I also need to, because a lot of my time has been spent talking to developers and I need to, we don't currently really have a relationship with or not in the way that I would like, with the engineers, the planners, the um, the architects. You know, I'm keen that the broader professional teams understand what it is that we TfL are seeking to achieve, such that we move away from a world in which people wait, wondering on what's the next notice that TfL is going to issue and actually start to understand in advance rather better what it is we're trying to achieve and what those timescales are, and when then there might be something that's coming out um, you know, um, by e email from us in advance. Uh, in terms of last week, uh, last week was um, on Thursday night. I ended up working late, um, so it was actually I was walking. I got off the train. I was walking home at the point when it was ten o'clock. 
So I was refreshing Twitter, trying to find out what had happened on the exit poll. Um, and the tweet that I, the first tweet that I got after the exit poll just said, wow. And I was thinking, ideally, just a couple more words would have been helpful for me at that stage. Because it was good to know that it was wow. I just had no idea what wow in that context actually meant. Uh, having sp spent a lot of time telling people that uh, the political situation had no bearing on our aspirations in terms of property partnerships, the real truth, no, only kidding, the, um, what we're doing, I, I spent a lot of time trying to ensure that what we're, what we're doing is depoliticised, that people understand there's a broad range of sites we're looking to bring forward, it's regeneration in town centres, it's employment, it's housing, it's yes, there's value there as well. I think across the political spectrum there's broad support for what it is that we're trying to achieve. The biggest thing for me from last week really is that we have certainty and that really is the key issue from a TfL point of view. As it happens um, in central government we're working with people who we've been working with over a number of years. We understand where they're coming from. From a macro TfL point of view it means that we'll come under more focus in terms of our operational grant uh, capital investment will continue, uh, the government will, we hope, continue to support major investment like Cross, cross Rail 2, and that's important. Um, obviously, you know, the, from a macroeconomic point of view, the response to the market's been positive. Um, that helps us more broadly, but really, um, from our point of view, it's we've got certainty, we can focus on the long term. Um, there will be more pressure from a TfL point of view. That means more pressure on us to do, take, to do more and quicker with our sites. But frankly, that's no bad thing. The housing issue is now, you know, top of the tree. It's the biggest agenda item in London. It's the thing that concerns Londoners more than anything else. And I think what was interesting in the general election is that although housing rarely features as one of the big sort of three or four issues. Um, this time round, for the first time that I can remember actually, housing was a dog that at least began to bark and there are some obviously some major uh, commitments in the new government's um, uh, party manifesto and those will be reflected in the Queen's speech and legislation in the next few weeks. More on that in a moment. So on the national scene, housing is certainly now uh, a big issue. Um, I think when we see uh, the run into the mayor election next year, it will be a bigger issue still because clearly housing in London is um, is so important. So I think um, certainly the politicians are going to keep us on our toes, um, but intriguingly, perhaps they may not all be saying the same thing. Um, so uh, that will be quite interesting. Um, just a word or two about where we are, though. Um, the big issue, I guess, uh, the biggest the biggest kind of uh, theme around housing is that we need more of it. Uh, most of you will know that we've got a new London plan target of 42,000 homes a year um, and that implies a level of building which is close to double recent production rates. So big question is how do you deal with that long term gap between demand and supply? Um, it's more than a cyclical question, it's a structural question. Uh, and how do you kind of reorganise, restructure and incentivise the industry uh, to get close to um, or indeed surpass 42,000 new homes a year? What's quite interesting um, at the moment, if we just take a kind of spot check on that, is that over the last 12 months we know in London that we funded a production line that built more than 18,000 affordable homes in a single year. Um, now to put that into context, that's not been done uh, in any single year since 1981 um, and if you add to the 18,000 haven't got the stats yet but we reckon that um, certainly the private sector the market sector over the last 12 months has probably produced um, at least that number so what's quite interesting and we will get the stats um, towards the end of the calendar year they usually are out, out around about November is I think it's probably not wildly optimistic to think that over the last 12 months we may have got pretty close to 42,000 homes. So that's very interesting. Um, if I'm right, it proves that we can actually get pretty close to the new targets. The problem is, of course, that we will not be able to sustain that 
and that's a peak, that's a spike, which has got a lot to do with the current state of the business cycle and, frankly, loading a lot of public money into the affordable housing programme uh, at the back end of a three-year um, programme. So I think the positive thing I take out of that is that we have got, between us in this room and the many outside, the ability to get close to or indeed maybe even manage 40 to, 40 to 42,000 homes production, but uh, there are big questions about sustaining it. So in terms of trying to address that challenge really of how do we sustain those sorts of numbers, some of the things that are going on at the moment I think at least provide some clues. Um, so in uh, no particular order, uh, I think one of the really interesting things to um, uh, look at at the moment uh, and this is something certainly the new government I think will remain committed to, it was announced in the budget, is this new thing called a London Land Commission. Um, that's going to be jointly chaired by central government minister and the mayor. Its job is to finally, hopefully, get a real grip on public sector assets in London. Um, and by getting a grip, I mean certainly finding out more about where public land and assets lie um, in terms of what may be surplus or becoming surplus and how can we get that to the market in a more organised fashion. But I think perhaps more interestingly and more challengingly, um, finally really getting under the skin of where the public sector estate might be able to operate more efficiently, where we can release sites, uh, organise the public sector's affairs across agencies, across central, local government, regional government, um, to do more to release land. Um, and I think we'll be hearing a lot more about the London Land Commission now the election's done. Um, and I think trying to get that thing moving fast and liberating sites uh, and getting some real development activity on the back of land supply uh, that currently is perhaps uh, struggling to come forward from the public sector is going to be very interesting. I don't think it's the magic bullet. There is no magic bullet to housing in London, but I think that's an important part of the overall package. The next thing which is very current and I think you know quite exciting, it's certainly got a lot of people uh, energised, is the new housing zones programme in London, which is really a way of the way I like to describe it is a way of operationalising and funding and delivering some of our um, large opportunity areas and other regeneration locations where we know there's potentially uh, very powerful uh, potential for new house building and indeed community regeneration. But for various reasons, sometimes to do with land assembly, sometimes to do with the need for forward funding, sometimes to do with... Um, remediation or local infrastructure, things aren't happening or they're not happening very quickly or in a coordinated fashion. So the Housing Zones programme is a new £400 million programme, a mixture of grant and long-term recoverable investment to get um, initially at least 20 of these zones moving and we've got a target to drive forward uh, at least 50,000 new homes through that programme. And we're working with a number of partners around the table. I mean, we're doing a lot of work down in uh, Southall with Pat, um, looking to try and assemble something with real scale and pace around uh, the Crossrail station that's coming at Southall. Um, it's been quite an exciting program because it's really got the boroughs uh, very closely engaged. These things are being uh, put together and led and driven by the boroughs. So it's about City Hall uh, coming together to fund local priorities, and we're very optimistic that that. Um, is going to be a very successful programme and indeed one of the things we're lobbying government for hard at the moment is to find funding to uh, have another round of housing zones. Um, next thing that's current, um, which is worth a word perhaps, is some of our major land and development projects. Um, there's a tremendous amount of activity going on. Uh, Barry's here, uh, Silvertown Keys has now got its planning consent which is fantastic news. Just over the water uh, we've got planning consent now for the big Chinese business centre, which ABP uh, are developing. Um, we've got a lot of activity going on on a lot of other our key sites. So just to pick one at random, Barking Riverside, where we've got a planning consent already for 11,000 homes. And in order to bring that forward, we need um, a railway solution to um, open the site up. And we've now got... Uh, that funded £200 million to drive an overground rail extension from Barking Town Centre. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, I think that's the first time that, certainly in London, there's been an overground railway built specifically to open up a housing site. 
so that's certainly broken new ground in quite um, uh, quite a creative way. Um, another thing to talk about, just briefly or mention anyway, is is PRS because I think there's been so much talk about PRS and institutional finance and getting more equity into the residential game. Um, I think there are still lots of um, difficulties with that, but I think we're now perhaps quite close to a tipping point where we're really seeing quite a lot of production coming through. And um, we've had some big pioneering deals like Delancey down at the Olympic Park and various others, but we've now taken a position at City Hall where most, if not all, of our major development opportunities now are briefed out with a, an obligation to bring forward a substantial proportion of new housing as long-term PRS, and we found that to be very successful. We're um, now in contract with a couple of big deals in Newham, which we think will bring uh, around about 2,000 units forward. We've just gone out to start the procurement process for our big site in West Ham, the old Parcel 4 depot next to West Ham Station. Um, and again, we will be looking for at least 30% um, of what is probably a two to 3,000 unit scheme uh, to come forward as long term. And by long term, I mean covenanted PRS. Um, we've, 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 we've amended planning policy at City Hall to try and deal with some of the issues around viability for long term PRS. Uh, but I think that's one to watch because I think we are now genuinely moving from um, uh, a war of words around the benefits of long-term PRS to seeing schemes coming through, which is very exciting. So just to finish, a couple of thoughts perhaps on what the future holds, um, because I think um, you know, there's, um, there's going to be, as I say, a renewed interest and focus around housing as the new government settles down and the mayoral candidates for next May start to um, uh, get their acts together. Um, I think the first thing to say is that, broadly speaking, I think there's more uh, uh, that the major parties actually have in common around housing in London uh, than they have in difference. I think that's quite an important point to make. You know, I used to work at City Hall on housing when Ken was mayor. I've been doing it with Boris as mayor. They have their differences but I don't think there's very much between them in terms of the need for more housing of all tenures. Um, I think that will continue. I think there will continue to be a very welcome emphasis on infrastructure, and one of the really powerful things, I think, from the new government's commitments is a commitment to Crossrail 2, um, and I think we'll see more, uh, more of that, which is good. That will certainly unite whoever's the mayor next year, uh, hopefully with the new government. I think we will also see probably more pressure on um, ensuring that the planning process in London works as smoothly and as quickly and as consistently as it possibly can. Um, it doesn't always operate like that and that's going to be I think an early discussion between boroughs, city hall and the new government. Um, be interesting to get thoughts on that one. And then I guess um, two other things. One which is quite important is that um, this government I think will probably remain quite committed to the principle of devolution from central government to sub-regional government. Uh, there's been a lot from George Osborne about northern powerhouses and enfranchising the cities. Uh, I think you can take it as read that the current mayor and the next mayor will make the case for further devolution to London to try and organise its affairs to deal with housing and regeneration in a more bespoke way. And I suspect that there will at least be sympathy in national government for that. I think it will be very difficult to get the full-blown devolution that the London Finance Commission and others have argued for, by which I mean a full fiscal devolution of property taxes. But I think we might see more coming down from central government, and that can probably uh, only be a good thing. And then finally, because I think this is really quite important, and none of us really know quite how it's going to work yet, uh, one of the things the Queen's speech will certainly contain, and uh, we'll also be in a housing bill which will be tabled at some point in the next uh, couple of months, is the right to buy for housing association tenants and associated with that uh, mechanisms to fund the discounts to housing associations and that's going to mean some quite interesting developments in London I suspect because government has said that in order to pay for the discounts for housing association right to buy tenants and to pay for a number of other things, a, a billion pound national brownfield fund and one or two other things, they're going to look to um, uh, obligate local authorities to um, sell um, some of their most valuable housing stock. Now, we don't quite know how that's going to work yet, 
Uh, but what we do know is that a lot of the most valuable council housing stock in the UK is in London. Um, so I think unpacking that over the next few months is going to be a very interesting set of challenges. Those are my sort of thoughts and one or two speculations. Happy to have some chat around the table. Brilliant. Possibly, yeah. I think um, I wouldn't say as a, I wouldn't say that that's the right thing to do generically because I mean a quite a number of the housing zones can and should I think deliver a range of affordable housing. But I think one of the um, challenges of housing zones is to get things moving quickly. Uh, in some cases, there are genuine viability concerns. One of the things we're giving some thought to in terms of those zones that currently don't have a planning. Uh, consent, and bear in mind that some of them do, um, is whether we ought to be moving to uh, a more um, tariff-based approach for affordable housing. So the, um, the rules are very clearly set out and we can perhaps save time with some of the viability appraisals in Section 106 negotiations. I also think, and this is a personal view, that one of the things we might want to start giving a bit more thought to in London is whether, ideally, the way we approach affordable housing needs to take a bit more account of the different value points, by which I mean if you've got a very low value location in Outer East London, should you have exactly the same affordable housing policy as you might have in Richmond or Kensington and Chelsea? And actually, I think you can play with the PRS model in some locations, perhaps with a, a slight discount to market, and that might provide quite a credible, affordable alternative. That is not currently London plan policy, by the way. Well, I mean, I, 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 I very much agree with Pat's kind of description and interpretation of things. I think we need to step back a little bit from these kind of rather crude kind of, there's got to be 25% of that and 30% of this. And It does seem to me that, that the real challenge is about finding, as Pat puts it, you know, a range of affordabilities and tenure should reflect that. When I said it's not current planning policy to do what, um, what we've just been talking about, one of the problems in London is that our planning policy is derived from you know, national planning policy, and national planning policy defines affordable housing very rigidly. Um, I would argue, and I think lots of others would argue, that it doesn't necessarily make sense to have policy determined by a national government that's trying to make affordable housing policy in Middlesbrough uh, exactly the same as affordable housing policy in Kingston and Richmond. It just doesn't make sense. So I think, you know, and I think this is where some of the regen activity that's going on now in, you know, Zone 3, Zone 4 and so forth is very interesting because you can be very creative with those value points and find opportunities for people to afford housing, good quality housing, uh, but it's much easier to do in viability terms if you move away from some of these rigid Meridian Water's got to have 30% affordable housing, etc. So I would actually be a lot more relaxed about, um, about targets. Are much more interested in um, what is uh, what is sensible to do at a local level to provide as much variety of housing that is affordable as possible. Um, but you know, I think others would say that's perhaps not right. What you should do is just have a straightforward percentage target, and so everyone knows what the rules are. Make it a tariff system. I think that's superficially attractive, but actually quite difficult to get right. Um, so those are my thoughts, but. You know, can we expect some official policy changes in the near term? I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. I think the current government is probably going to be um, more interested in what we might call intermediate housing. Um, it seems to me that that is arguably the big political pressure point in London, because you know there's for a long time been some very clear policy around social housing, um, um, and we've got very relatively little intermediate housing, whether it's discount market rent, shared ownership, rent to buy, that sort of thing that generation rent really needs. Um, and to put that into context, I think shared ownership is still less than 1.5% of tenures in London. Uh, and you look out there and you say, who's really struggling with, with their housing at the moment? It's exactly that sort of client group for whom shared ownership, discount market rent and other products really ought to be supplying a lot more uh, a lot more homes. I, ultimately, well, sorry, I'm keen that we have 
that we make explicit what the trade-off is. And there's a, you know, there is a clear trade-off between density, um, levels of affordable, and however those are are defined, um, the extent to which we can invest locally in order to improve that particular station, and the amount of net proceeds that are re are reinvested in the transport system. And you know, the the answer surely must vary on a site-by-site -site basis as to which of these is most appropriate. So we, for example, have 15 development sites in Westminster. The answer can't be that it's the, you know, the answer can't be that there's a single template for development in Westminster. It must make sense that we have a joined up conversation with Westminster that says, mm. where is it across the borough that one might look to um, extract value versus place affordable versus make local station improvements versus get <coughs> density and that's an obvious logical discussion to be having on either given TFL's estate a borough wide base basis or even a London wide basis I have to say people may get the theory of it it's proving harder than I would like to sit down and actually have those sensible conversations and I think this is where you know the London Land Commission I think is an important signal as much as anything that the public sector really should be more joined up on these things it you know we should be in a position which the public sector is coming together to say we've got these land holdings we're not making the best use of them how can we sit down and have a sensible conversation about how we can take forward de um, development on these sites and the answer to that cannot be in my mind here's a rigid template and it has to be applied on an unquestioning basis site by site by site I think that's quite possible and certainly we've got um, in my bit of the GLA quite a big interest in looking at releasing some wharves and consolidating others in, um, in, in and around the Royal Docks. Um, I think one of the interesting developments a few months ago was um, the Chancellor saying that he was minded to uh, fully devolve responsibility for protected wharves, safeguarded wharves policy to the Mayor. Uh, along with um, protected views, because uh, at the moment both of those, as you know, are a matter not just for the Mayor but also for the Secretary of State. Um, personally, I think that's a very sensible thing to do because it means that we can make decisions more quickly and more locally. Um, so it'll be down to the Mayor in future, I guess, to make decisions alone uh, in consultation with others um, about possibly releasing some wharves, and I would expect to see that, that happening. Um, we're doing lots of work behind the scenes um, and actually on specifically the disused station it's take, we've been working for 12 months to make sure that when we bring it to market all of those issues are addressed and we have answers to them and I think more broadly on our sites um, part of what I'm looking for is that the development team within TFL identifies the sites and addresses to some extent the planning issues but certainly the operational issues before it's brought to, to market. Um, and part of that is about um, London Underground's engineers who, you know, the, the mindset within particularly London Underground is transformed from where it was two, three years ago. I'm not sure the extent to which it's visible yet but the conversations that I have and my team has are completely different from where we were. So we've got you know the engineers, the infrastructure protection um, people who are now thinking afresh about how they can bring sites forward and it, it's not a difficult conversation to have to say well actually you're the people who understand this best how do, you, how do we resolve those issues? And I think from a TfL point of view, TfL will be willing, keen, that if there's work that needs to be done, we should do that work ourselves and we should invest up front so that the infrastructure issues are addressed before it's then brought to market, because those are often issues that we are frankly best able to manage. Um, that requires not insubstantial investment, it requires um, more people and more people are being recruited not just within my team but also 
within London Underground in particular in order to do the work that facilitates development. So, you know, our requirements within the development team, you know, people do need to have strong technical knowledge as well as to be able to sort of operate within a complex stakeholder environment and a sometimes frustrating organisation. Um, but we've also got London Underground who are now actively supportive, you know, in part because <coughs> over the next 10 years I'm due to be delivering £3.4 billion to the organisation that is currently assumed within our, bi our, our business plan. So if I fail to deliver those volumes of which £1.1 billion is assumed to come from property development activity, if I don't hit those numbers, projects have to be cut. So, you know, the organisation has woken up to the fact that this isn't something that they can just sit back and it'll all happen. They have to actively part participate in the process. That's also part of the reason why I'm keen on joint ventures, because, you know, at the senior levels in the organisation, right down to the, the, the people on the front line, if they understand that we as an organisation have skin in the game, then you end up with a different mindset, a different attitude and different outcomes as a consequence. Um, um, I think we know where some of those places are and I think there's more work to be done to identify others but I mean and often it's quite it, often it's quite s relatively straightforward and inexpensive I mean <coughs> you know I mentioned our, our, our parcel force site in West Ham I mean that's been stuck there for quite a long time um, partly because of the Olympics to be fair but the other reason is because although West Ham um, tube station is literally next to it runs along one side you can't actually access it. So, you know, our very good friends at TFL have now agreed to fund uh, a separate access point and suddenly um, that site is, is very viable. Take another example down at uh, another big land holding we've got actually just to the east of Bark in Riverside, Bean Park, which will be coming to the market in the next few months. Um, that's got potential for three or four thousand homes. There's no railway station. Uh, there's a railway line, no railway station. Now we know how much it'll cost to build the railway station. Again, we've got um, uh, um, an agreement through TfL to help to fund that. Um, so I think actually, and I'm going to pay credit to Graham. I think Graham's done an absolutely fantastic job um, at actually really sort of shifting cultures and behaviours in TfL. And I think for the first time, perhaps, you know, the property side and the operational side is really, and the financial side is really working together. I think the other thing that's really positive about TfL now is that they are genuinely facilitating and indeed in many respects helping to fund some of these often quite, as I say, quite modest infrastructure hits that then open up large sites. But there's undoubtedly more that can be done. And I think one of the challenges for us, and again this is where perhaps some of the housing zone stuff comes in, is that it will be a real tragedy if we do find ourselves with another generation of um, transport infrastructure investment and we haven't thought ahead to how we really exploit the opportunities for growth around those stations and if you look back over decades that unfortunately is the story in London isn't it we build that we build that we build the rail or the tube but we don't actually harness the uplift and I think we're beginning to put that right Well, I have to say, our experience at the moment of the Chinese is rather favourable. I mean, we're doing two big deals with them at the moment. One's at, um, I mentioned, at the Royal Albert Dock. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, no one else was terribly seriously uh, interested in Royal Albert Dock when we marketed it, what, three years ago. Um, and they've come in and um, they should be on site a little bit later this year. Um, and they're very ambitious and very enthusiastic and uh, they're now... Uh, claiming that they've got quite a lot of prelets, so I mean that's been quite a positive experience. It's been quite, it's been it's been a challenge at times, I think, with organisations that come with uh, no real experience of operating in London or indeed in this particular case operating outside mainland China. But you know we've managed to make that work. The other big one, of course, for us is is um, Greenwich Peninsula, where Night Dragon took um, Quintain and Lendlease out. Uh, and again, I mean, you know, uh, th th that's been quite a positive experience. We, we, we were struggling with that site because for various reasons, not to do, not le least to do with viability, we, 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 we weren't really getting any development. Uh, KD came in and um, uh, they, they've, they've thrown hundreds and hundreds of millions at this thing. Um, so I think, you know, there's some real advantages in that respect. If your question more is more about not the kind of heavyweight development investment, but who's actually buying, buying up finished units. 
No, I wouldn't argue for a quota system. I think, I, I, I think to some extent this is exaggerated. And anyway, it's a, it's 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 very difficult to demand managed like that. It seems to me. Um, so I think the really important thing is not to sort of shut London off from the world. It is to think creatively about how we harness that value and that appetite to do some of the things that we're talking about here, namely, you know, get regeneration working in places that it's currently not percolating to. And, and maybe some of that, David, goes back, I think you alluded to, I think City Hall keeps 7% of the taxes in London, whereas New York keeps 50%. So yeah. I mean, it's very hard to say, but, you know, who we the Londoner, you know, Chinese, Irish people, or Scottish people, you know, we all qualify if you like, but I think it's how we use the wealth that's generated from the overseas part. I think that's the real challenge. I agree with that. And more affordable housing then, I think, Pat, you, your point, however you define it, that people can't afford to live in London that work for us, which is not right, and it's not sustainable long term. Yeah. I mean, I do think this is this is this is this is the point, really. I think you know Tony Travers, finance commission, a year or so ago, made this point very clearly that, you know, the real way to unpack this and justify it and get people much more kind of comfortable with the idea of overseas investment and high net worth and all the rest of it would be if there was a much more explicit arrangement that said the taxation that's associated with that is transacted back to London. So if we could see that you know, wealthy investors in central London are really supporting growth in an affordable housing programme or infrastructure that enables ordinary Londoners to get better quality housing, that I think would be fantastic. But we haven't quite won that debate with the Treasury yet. From a TfL point of view, um, we'll be operationally self-sufficient from 2020-2021, um, in part but only in part because of the work that we're doing from a commercial development point of view. Um, and across all of our activity, our focus is squarely and absolutely on long-term revenue rather than short-term capital receipts. And so, um, you know, we are very focused on generating recurring revenue streams that gives us certainty, that gets us out of a parent-child relationship with central government that enables us to plan for the long term. Um, and, you know, the planets are aligning in terms of the fact that our, in terms of our uh, we continue to make large efficiency savings, we're continuing to generate more money. Um, we are better placed than we ever will be to ride through the storms. I think part of the role of organisations like TfL is to plan for the long term. Um, and I think, you know, we've got, we're sort of working now or having discussions now with future mayoral candidates so that they understand what it is that we're trying to achieve and how the commercial development activity is a relatively small part of that, but a part of that in terms of giving us long-term st stability, so there can be long-term, so there can be long-term planning. Because David was rightly talking about the extent to which d um, d development and transport goes hand in hand, and you know the work that we're doing now is frankly taking us back to the 1910s when this was understood. Mm -hmm. The relationship of transport, infrastructure d and d development, that's the thats what the city is founded on. I'm still not sure that the city as a whole has got its head round how what going from 8.6 8.6 to 9 to 10 and onwards, I'm not sure that people have quite yet got their head round the extent to which the city has to change, but that's only going to happen with housing that looks and feels different from, from what's there at the present, a city that looks and feels different from what's there, and that you know, clearly has to be based on the transport network and but a different transport network if it's going to c continue to function. I mean, yeah, I I I just say a couple of um, make a couple of responses to your point, Barry. I think absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that bedevils policy in this regard is you know everyone takes a snapshot view. This is the current state of the market, and then forgets that things are going to shift there's not enough planning for the longer term and then there's a kind of set of crisis measures when the business cycle moves on. Now, to some extent that's inevitable because that's the way politics works, but I think I would argue, and I think we're making some progress in this regard, that 
there's a number of things you can do to hedge the risk around the cyclical um, point. I think one is that it's really important to divert, diversify the offer. So I think things like PRS, things like discount market rent, things like other intermediate products, I think are much more resilient to that business cycle and it's one of the reasons why we're very keen to do more of it. I think as well, um, one of the things the public sector can usefully do, it seems to me, is to provide a platform where you can manage some of those risks as the cycle shifts, by which I mean, you know, I think it's actually quite a valuable role for the public sector to help with things like site assembly um, and manage land release because we can take a, a longer term view and a more benign view about when we look for our returns. We can manage those according to the business cycle. And then I think there are probably some other things that we certainly should be looking at. So just to put one example out there, you know, should the public sector be thinking if it really wants to put a 10, 15, 20 year housing plan together to say that in certain conditions uh, or at certain points in the cycle, we might actually provide some sort of underwrite or some sort of guarantee in terms of purchasing uh, units if the market comes off at any particular given point. And I think you know, we need to start thinking about things like that, because it seems to me it's your job to make money through the business cycle. It's our job in the public sector, arguably, to try and mitigate some of those uh, ups and downs. And at the moment, we don't, frankly, spend enough time thinking about that very explicitly. Yeah, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? I think, I mean, as ever, there's good and bad. I think. I mean, wandering around London and, and looking at what's going on, um, occasionally I do get quite depressed, more than occasionally, if I'm honest. Um, but equally, I think there's some really quite inspiring stuff happening in London. I was, I was with the um, judging panel for the Housing Design Awards a couple of weeks ago, looking at London schemes that are either in construction or complete. And actually, I mean, um, that judging panel has been doing these things for, for years in most cases. They're quite old, a lot of them. Um, but, but they were all of a view the, the quality of what they were seeing in London was very substantially greater than it was four or five or six years ago um, and that was quite interesting and I think that again one of the things that, that is really interesting about sort of tying the housing story into the regeneration story is that you really can't do that without placemaking I mean the stuff that we're talking about the sort of stuff that Graham's doing is big scale um, change it's transformational change and that gives you not just the opportunity, I think, but the obligation to really master plan those places and think about how you create value. I mean, I think that some of this as well comes back to, you know, my rather optimistic take on the future for long-term PRS. I think it's very interesting to think about what, you know, those that are going to have a long-term hold position on stock are looking for. So they're not just going to bang it up and walk away, they're actually going to be there for 10, 20, 30 years. So I think all of this means that some of the market pressures are pushing us towards a bigger obligation for placemaking. And I think at local level, you know, most boroughs are really, really clear about the importance and obligation on, 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 on designing and planning these places properly. So, ever the optimist. Uh, from my point of view, we have moved our criteria and across all sites uh, value will be less than half of what we're looking for so we'll always judge quality more than value when doing any work now or in the future uh, whether that's on property or anything else that we're doing I think it's um, trying to deliver money particularly guaranteed money generally leads to the wrong outcome um, now that of course requires you know, you can have something that's focused on quality rather than value, but you also need to have people who are best able to judge quality, and that's part of the reason why um, we need to be either assembling the brightest and best or working with the brightest and best at City Hall and elsewhere in order to make that happen. But yes, I think people generally know what good looks like when they see it, um, and there are some examples of it, and I agree there are more examples of it now than there has been in, in the past. So we're doing something right. Um, well, you see, I, I think some of the best examples we've got are, are, are actually volume builder um, projects. You know, to be fair, I think, you know, if you look at, you know, it's, it's got cabinet full of trophies. If you go and look at something like St Andrew's Hospital, it's a Barrett scheme. I mean, that's a really, I think, very, very credible piece of placemaking, you know, it's pushed densities up in quite a challenging area, um, 
I think that's a really good example. I think Barrett have done a number of schemes in London which are really high class. If you look at things like Kidbrook or Woodbury Down and the work that you know Tony Pidgeley's outfit's doing, I mean, in, in urban re in, in state regeneration terms, I mean, this is really pushing things way beyond the quality that, that we're used to, either in London or indeed nationally. So I, I'm, I think you know, we can hold our heads up and say anyone in the world can visit London and we can take them to some you know, really, really difficult locations like the old Ferrier Estate or Woodbury Down. Uh, and say, look, you know, you'd, you'd struggle to find better than this anywhere, frankly. So I, 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 there are some house builders which are not quite at that level yet, but I, I wouldn't want to denigrate the volume business. I think, you know, they're, they're, they're doing some outstandingly good work. And what's great is that once you get those examples, you know, it's something for other people to aspire to. So places like Kidbrook, Woodbury Down, St Andrews are really now very, very tangible kind of examples of where everybody should be. And I think, you know, we should be, we should take some encouragement from that. Well, I mean, yeah, I, look, bill cost inflation is a massive issue and, you know, I don't want to kind of underestimate the importance of that. But I think it comes down to, you know, the quality of the relationship you've got with the partners, the degree to which you're willing to be flexible, you know, all of this is going to come down to viability and what is possible and not taking, particularly with long-term projects, a rigid view that doesn't take account of, you know, as we've said, the market cycle. But, you know, I don't see any evidence in London at the moment that what's happened to bill cost inflation over the last couple of years is really meaning that the quality is coming off. I don't see that at all. I think people are managing it quite adequately. Um, now, we need more we do need to address some of the supply chain issues. There's no question about that. You know, one of the big um, constraints, it seems to me, on delivering anything close to those target numbers I talked about year on year is, you know, where do we get the management skills? Where do we get the construction skills? Where do we get the supply chains in terms of materials and all of that? Um, that's maybe another breakfast. Um, <laughs> Perfect. But, uh, but that remains a challenge. Um, well, I, I've got one question. I'm conscious we've got probably five minutes to run. Um, there's plenty of time to hang around afterwards, mill and network and chat. But um, if you don't mind, so you've 42,000 target and your target, Graham, of, of, of getting um, revenue flowing into TfL. We read a lot about what the private sector wants from the public sector, whether that's planning change or what have you. What can this room do to make your lives easier and to expedite the process? Um, <laughs> from my point, of, from a personal point of view, I'm very. What do I want? What I what I don't want is for people to, for you, to be sat there, going, why the hell are they doing that, or why are they not doing this? If there are things that you think we could and should be doing, I'd much rather that you let me know what it is that you think we should be doing. If there are examples as to what you think good looks like, I'm quite happy to get off my backside and come out and see what you think good looks like. So I think um, we can be a difficult organisation to do business with. There are procurement and other processes through which we have to go. But generally, if you leave me to sort out how we might get there, but if you can understand that we are trying to do the right thing, and if you think there are things that we should be doing, or things that you're sat there going, why the hell are they doing that? I would much rather know about that and try and get my head around how we might solve that. And I think because the scale of the challenge that we both have is certainly not something that we can manage by ourselves and the more that you understand what it is that we're trying to achieve the more that you can participate in that process ultimately that must be to our our wider gain mm. well it's interesting I, it's a good question i think i was in paris a couple of weeks ago um spent two or three days there just talking to them about housing and regen and all the stuff we're talking about and i came away thinking, my goodness me, in London we've got fantastically richer and more complex and more extensive dialogue with the private sector and the public sector, it seems to me. Um, I mean, there is some merit in the way the French do things, which is, you know, the state piles in and spends a great deal of money and, 
you know, they're very confident about that, but they, they certainly don't have the same level of interaction and uh, I don't think the same level of creativity in terms of their public-private partnerships. So I think first point is one of, the, one of the real delights, frankly, in working in London, I think, is that there's so many of these kind of interactions and conversations and uh, partnerships going on, and that's a really rich thing. Second thing I'd say um, as a challenge back to you guys is what do we want from what do we want from the private sector? I think we want you know the things that you'd expect me to say an honest relationship. Um, I think we want an emphasis on uh, a commitment to the long term as well as short term, and I think we want you know a um, um, uh, a view about creativity. Really, we're often um, challenged about whether we're willing to kind of interpret things differently or. Or, or modify policy or take a view. And I think I'd say the same thing back, really. I think, you know, we need more innovation. We need more creativity. We all need to be thinking quite nimbly about responding to these pressures. And then last, and I think it's probably the most important thing, is that, you know, this fantastic city facing these enormous pressures um, really does, frankly, need a better deal from government in terms of being allowed to have more control of its own destiny and sort out its own resources. Seems to me that's the single biggest strategic goal that we face over the next few years. How can this city, which after all, I think, if you put a red line around it, would be the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world, how does it get more responsibility over its kind of resource base and its ability to be able to chart its own course in the world? And I think that's really where, where, where you lot are really quite important because I think the more we can sort of collaborate and make that case to government, the, there should be a bit more devolution, there should be a bit more autonomy um, and a bit more kind of um, letting go from the national state. I think the, the more um, likely we are to solve these problems. So carry on lobbying.